I'm Steve Walker Duncan, and I'm on a quest. As a professional chef for 25 years and an instructor at the Camosun College Culinary Arts Program, I truly believe we have some of the best food in the world right here on the West Coast. Join me in discovering some of these culinary treasures. This week, we have the great pleasure to be in Whistler, one of the world's great ski destinations, host of the 2010 Winter Olympics, and just a fabulous, fabulous place. 10 meters of snow per year, 37 lifts, which can carry over 6,000 skiers per hour, nearly 33 square kilometers of skiable terrain with more than 200 trails. Whistler Blackcomb is truly a winter sports paradise. It's also a sophisticated international resort, which attracts around 2 million visitors every year from all around the world and is home to many restaurants and art galleries. But today, the snow and the weather are just perfect, so everything else can wait. I'm going skiing. I'm lucky to have mountain guide Dale Hoddle to show me around. Two mountains, incredible snow, fabulous runs, incredible restaurants, great bars, everything you need is right here. This is absolutely fantastic. I don't think I've ever had such a good day skiing. Well, I'm glad to hear that. After all that, I'm ready for some food. I'm staying at the superb new Nita Lake Lodge, where behind the bar, Haley Pasemko is expanding the art of cocktail making. Well, this looks more like a buffet than a bar. This looks <laughs> fabulous. What have you got back here? Um, I've got all kinds of delicious things I like to play with when I'm bartending. Some of the exotic ingredients include dried lavender, candied bird's eye chilies, candied orange zest, and pickled sunchokes. Okay, Haley, let's make some cocktails. Wonderful. It's got a very, very strange blend of ingredients. Yeah. If I had read these things on the list, I would never order this cocktail. So I've decided to call it Trust Me. <laughs> so we've got garlic and we've got vinegar I know. in a cocktail. This is why it's called Trust Me. Okay, and I do, implicitly. Wonderful. I would never doubt you again, Haley. <laughs> that uh, is absolutely fabulous. Yeah, Thank you very, good. very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Down in the kitchen, Chef Owen Foster is showing me how he prepares brasola. Uh, if you can hand me that, that piece of beef, we're going to just gonna eat here. Yeah. That's a, an eye of round, so. Look at that, what a beauty. Yeah. Owen starts by quickly trimming the fat, then it's spice time. We've got some fresh bay leaves, which I've been using in with the brisola quite often. Fennel seed, I like to use a bit of. Coriander seed and beef, pretty classic. Yeah. A little bit of mace, I think will taste good in that. A little juniper and not a lot else. While I grind the spices, Owen checks his recipe. The proportions of salt and sugar are critical. Dry curing like this has been used for centuries as a way of preserving meat. Salt is strictly a tool, it's got no flavor. It's gonna give the characteristic of, of cured meat, but all the flavors are gonna come from what you're grinding. Right. The meat is rolled, bagged, and vacuum sealed, and then left for several weeks to cure. This is only one of many traditional charcuterie items that Owen produces. And the end result? I was intrigued by the infused balsamic vinegar that Haley Pasemko used in her cocktail recipe. And it turns out it's made in Whistler, so I had to find out more. We start with traditional balsamic vinegar from Modena, Italy. We start with the six-year-old vinegar. Okay. And uh, as you can see, I've got this big kettle back here. In this pot, we'll slow cook uh, the balsamic vinegar to concentrate the flavors. So we reduce it by about 50% in volume. Okay. So what that does is that yields a very viscous, uh, robust, and, uh, and a sweet but acid uh, finished product. And right. during the reduction process, we'll infuse it with uh, different things. So what I'm gonna show you today is uh, the strawberry fig reduction that, we've, uh, that we produce, so. Fabulous. The great thing about our reductions is we don't use any artificial thickeners like cornstarch. You're just using the pulp and the, the, the gums and the pectins from the fruit itself. Exactly, yeah. And the one question I have to ask, who is Nona Pia? 
Uh, Nona Pia is uh, my children's grandmother, which is my mom, and okay. Nona Pia has been my inspiration around cooking. My parents uh, emigrated from Italy to Canada okay. uh, years and years ago. They're northern Italian, right. and she's always been my inspiration around cooking. And look at the thickness of that. Yeah. All natural. Whistler is home to some of Canada's best restaurants, and most of those top chefs prefer cooking with gas. Before the 2010 Olympics, that gas had to be brought in by rail or truck. But when the highway from Vancouver was improved for the Games, a new gas pipeline was installed. Though it did lead to some challenges. We just brought natural gas to Whistler in 2009. Before that, we had a piped propane system that we operated here, but we found that the customer base was kind of outgrowing uh, the system's capacity. Right. And Whistler was very interested in having natural gas service as a part of their sustainability plan. Right. So we now have natural gas service in Whistler. Um, we converted 14,000 gas appliances in the summer of 2009. That's a fairly tall order. <laughs> it was. It was quite an order. There were about 100 of us from all over the province, some from the island, some from the interior. Um, we came, we lived up here, um, we converted every range, every fireplace, every boiler, every water heater, every barbecue, yeah, yeah, so we had an interesting summer. I'm visiting one of Whistler's top restaurants. The food here is out of this world, but that's not the only reason I'm here. They really take drinking vodka seriously here at Whistler. I'm here with JS, the beverage director of Barefoot Bistro. JS, thank you very much. My pleasure. I understand we're going to uh, drink some vodka Absolutely. seriously. Absolutely. We're so serious, we put a hat to do it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Cover me, I'm going in. The Barefoot Bistro's Belvedere Ice Room is a sub zero bar where guests clad in luxurious goose down parkas can experience the best vodkas from around the world. The walls are lined with ice in which sits the perfectly chilled vodka. And even the bar is a block of solid ice. This is what I call cool. So because we're in the Belvedere room, okay. we're gonna start with Belvedere. Okay. Uh, Belvedere is definitely one of my favorite vodkas. It's fantastic vodka from Poland, mm -hmm. made out of rye. And rye is the original grain that was used when vodka was first invented and first distilled. Well, it wasn't potatoes. Uh, no, not potatoes. That's a big misconception, actually. That's good vodka, da. That really is. It's got it's got character. As Absolutely. You say, people are used to that sort of tasteless vodka, but that actually has some nice character and some little spice to it. Absolutely. It's a great sipping vodka because you do have a complexity, like a flavor profile to it. Uh, it's not something that you want to mask with either pop or juice, yep. uh, yep. something you can drink as a vodka martini uh, on the rocks or on its own, does a great job. That's fabulous, that's awesome. Alongside the world's finest, there's a new locally made vodka that's organic. Made by master distiller Tyler Schramm, 20 minutes north of here in Pemberton. Now, vodka doesn't freeze, of course, because of the alcohol content, and it's, it's got that nice sort of thick, oily richness to it when it's when it's this cold, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Well, it freezes at minus 96 degrees Celsius. Okay. So right here, at about minus 28. So this gives a does give a little extra viscosity to the uh, to the spirit, and 100% uh, from uh, Pemberton potatoes. They get a nice smoky flavor. Very different. Very, very, very different, different. Very different characteristics. It's one of the most flavorful vodkas we have on the market. Yeah. And so this one is done in a traditional way, uh, copper pot stills uh, that gives really, a really rich character. So the same kind of stills that they use in Scotland to make their Scotch whiskies or in cognac to produce their, uh, their brandies. I was just going to say, it's, it's got those kind of nuances that Scotch does. Absolutely. It. From one freezer to another, I'm hot on the trail of organic vodka, and it all begins right here. You're watching organic potatoes being polished at Across the Creek Organics in the Pemberton Valley, just north of Whistler. Yeah, the mountains are great. Their isolation is, is a really big deal with potatoes to keep viruses out. Right. Um, the, the snow and the cold winters that we get. On the coast, they have to cool their sheds down all winter. Right. And we don't have to do that. We can use night air, like we have air systems in here to use the night air to keep the, the pile nice and cool throughout the winter and, and keep them from sprouting, keep them so we can uh, you know, wash them up and sell them for you know, six months during the winter. Bruce initially took a risk going organic, but he was in for a real surprise. We were amazed, like how many customers were out there. We, we almost didn't have to 
promote our stuff. We just had to greet the people that were already into it. They were and, waiting for it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Now, the most important question, vodka. What he's taking is basically off-grade potatoes. Yeah. It, it means that, you know, for that 10, 15% that we're calling out, that we have a home for them. And this is where all those formerly homeless potatoes end up. Wow, this is something else. Tyler Schramm, thank you for inviting us here oh. to your distillery. What is this? This looks like something out of a Jules Verne novel. <laughs> this is the heart of our operation. These are our two German-made stills. The idea was born while visiting his brother's small farm in the upper Pemberton Meadows. The farmer next door was growing potatoes on their property and happened to be doing so the year that they moved in and my brother and I were out there staring at the potato field one day and kind of just dreaming about what, what, what could you make out what of potatoes. Yeah, <laughs> and this is, this is where we ended up. That's <laughs> yeah. such a vision, that's awesome. Yeah, spent a year in Scotland studying and did a master's degree in distilling. Yep. And w while I was over there, I, I had to start tasting vodkas and that, that really got me into being a bit of a, a connoisseur by having sort of being forced to taste a, yeah. a lot of vodkas and really using them different ways and a lot of the traditional Eastern European vodkas actually had they, they would purposely try to retain some character from the, whatever the raw material right. that they were using into their final product and that, that's the route that we went to that more classic Eastern European style vodka. You've actually just won some some very prestigious awards for your vodkas. Yes we did and uh, it was last, last March, actually. We just, just passed the year anniversary of winning a, a, a double gold and the Spirit of the Year of the World Spirits Awards in Austria, which was uh, an amazing experience for us. And That's got to be quite, a, quite an honour for a, for a relatively new distiller, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah it was a, an amazing honour. And, uh, and we were pretty confident that we were producing something special. Yeah. We also knew that it was pretty unique because we had gone the, the sipping vodka route and there, there's not a lot of true sipping vodkas available in North America so we weren't ex exactly sure how the, the judges were going to respond to having yep. a vodka with a subtle flavour to it. I'd never thought in such a short period of time that we would end up with a double goal. That some people go a lifetime without that happening. So. Yeah, yeah. Nostra V. Well, I don't think I've had as much fun as that in a very long time. Those mountains are just beautiful. Today, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Ryan Cochran, Olympic medalist, swimmer, into the kitchen. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for having me. I gather food is a big part of, <laughs> of your life when you're training and when you're competing, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, eating, you know, between six and 8,000 calories a day can be... Uh, a day. A day. And uh, it can be a little rough if it's not, you know, delicious food. And So what we're going to do today, we're going to do something which should fit right in with your regime because we're going to do a gnocchi made with uh, ricotta cheese. Perfect. So let's get started. First thing we're going to do is we're going to make the gnocchi. Perfect. Okay, so gnocchi is a dumpling basically. So I've got a, a bowl here. Now what I've done, if you want to just pass me that, that ricotta, what I've sure. done is I've just put it in a strainer just to get rid of any excess liquid. That little bit of liquid will just sort of make the dumplings a little soggy. So if you just drain it for an hour or so, okay. that can go in there. And then we need to separate some eggs. Doing eggs. Okay, so you crack it just a little bit. Are you watching carefully because you're going to do one in a minute? You're going to do one in a minute. Worried. Okay, open it up, let the yolk sit in one half, and then just roll it back into the other until you get all that white out of there. Make it look so easy. It is, it really is. <laughs> Perfect. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna give you one, yeah, let you do that. I find the hardest part is breaking it open. It's not the same. That's right, just yeah. getting it cracked. That's it, perfect. You got two good halves. Perfect. I need a little bit of sea salt, just a pinch in there. And we've got a little bit of fresh black pepper. And last thing we need is a little bit of chopped parsley. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of parsley here. Sure. And I'll take a little bit on this side. Basically, the easiest way to do this is just kind of bunch it up. Then just start at one end, keep the tip of your knife on the face of the cutting board, and just drop the back down. That's it. And then you can just scoop that up with a knife and toss that in there as well. You've got a big year coming up next year, haven't you? Yeah, the Olympic year is, you know, all anyone can talk about is the Olympics, and yeah. so you kind of have to be ready for that. And, uh, we have a bunch of little meets in between there, um, lots of training camps away because, you know, time away is that much better. Yeah, that distraction helps you to focus, doesn't it? Yeah. So what I've done is I've just brought all the, the sort of the wet ingredients together, and then what we want to do is just add enough flour so that we create a nice stiff dough, basically. Okay. Okay. So it depends very much on the size of your eggs, but you're looking at about half a cup of flour in there or thereabouts. 
Okay, so I'm gonna give you a give you a bash at this. I'm just gonna sure. add a little more to that because it just needs to stiffen up. It's a lot thicker than that, actually. Like, yeah. It's a lot. Because yeah. we're gonna shape this. We're gonna okay. shape this into quenelles or footballs, if you the like. The technical term. Right? The technical yeah. term. <laughs> okay, so that's what we're looking for. So as I say, it's 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 kind of stiff, but if you touch it, you know, it's still a little bit on the sticky side. Right. And then the fun part, this is where the two spoons come in. So what you want to do is just take a take about a half a spoonful. Yep. Okay. And then just pull the off the spoon with the other spoon. And you do that a couple of times. Okay. Okay. Just like so. And then just drop that onto the floured tray there. Is that enough? Yep. And you just do that in two or three motions. Is that long enough? Like. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's fine. These should be misshapen. And if you don't want to quenelle them, you can just take these and drop them into the water as they are. Right. Okay. If you want to do them as a, you know, as sort of a free form. Right. So the next thing we're going to do, we're going to poach these. Okay. okay. I've got a big pot of, of boiling water on lots of water. Okay. Um, rapid boil. A little bit of salt in there. And as you can see, they sink to the bottom. And is it you know they're ready when they're floating? That's or? right. Okay. That's right. Once they start to float up, then we know they're done. These are not going to take very long. While they're doing that, we're going to get our sauce going. Okay. All we need to do, I've got everything pretty much chopped. So I've got our, our nice heirloom tomatoes here. I left a couple yeah, of they look fantastic. Just, so the only thing we need to do is we need to do a, a garlic clove. Okay. One each. I'll show you my famous trick for doing garlic. Just put your knife on it and just give it a little gentle whack. And then the skin will just slip right off. And then we're going to do the same thing again. Hold your knife handle right off the, the board. And then <laughs> give it a good whack this time. <laughs> there you go. Minced garlic. There you go. Okay. So, and I've got my chopped onions here. I've got a pan on, and we need a little bit of, again, olive oil. So we don't need a lot of it, just enough basically to lubricate the bottom of the pan. All right. Okay. Then with our finely diced onions, and then we'll throw our little bits of garlic in there. Perfect. And as always, okay, a little salt, yeah. and a little bit of black pepper. We'll let that do its thing for a, a couple of seconds. Perfect. And then I've got here some finely diced jalapeno pepper. So a little bit of zip, yeah, okay, I like it. but not too much. Jalapeno is fairly mild, so I'm just going to throw those into there. The onions we don't want them to color, so just a little translucency in there, so they start to look a little bit see-through, and just give them about 30 seconds to a minute. That's all it takes, it's easy. just enough to bring the sweetness of the onions out. Then in with our tomatoes, okay, and once again we'll just give them a little stir, and that sauce is pretty much done. Okay. Okay. It's yeah. gonna, we're going to cook that for a minute or two just to soften the tomatoes and break it down. But the whole idea of this dish is it's a nice, fresh, light dish. Yeah. So meanwhile, these gnocchi are pretty much done, and I've got this tray here for them. And we just have to lift these guys out. And we want to check them. So we'll check the first one just to make sure they are fully cooked, because we're not going to cook these anymore after that. And they shouldn't look... Yeah, you see these need another minute or two. They're still a little bit doughy in the center. They take about five to eight minutes. So meanwhile, we can go back to our finishing. So we've got some nice fresh basil. And this is going to go into our sauce. And if, with any herb, you want to add this right at the end. Right. If you are using dried herbs, then yeah. they want to go in early so that they rehydrate. Right. And okay. they've lost their color anyways. Right. So if we just pick the leaves off the stalk, you actually spend a few seconds just to stack them. Because then you just roll them around one leaf. The thing with basil is it's very sensitive to pressure. So this way you're, you're just being nice and gentle with it. Yeah. And this time just do the same again. Just nice fine slices right with the back end of the knife there. So you were in, you were in Beijing. I was. And you did very well in Beijing. Yeah. Pretty well. Yeah. Um, yeah, our goal was, you know, get on the podium. That's what we talked about. But you don't like to share that goal with many people because it can get a little stressful. Yeah. And uh, I remember touching the wall and seeing my name and the, the three beside it. And I was just pissed. I was absolutely, <laughs> I was so livid because I was like, I was that close to winning. And yeah. uh, it's frustrating, but those are kind of the circumstances. And yeah. I think I've learned over the last couple of years and it's, it's been a fantastic motivator. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I think we're about ready to test our gnocchi one more time. Again, you want to always... You want to double check these. The last thing you want is to give somebody a gnocchi with a little, exactly. little bit of raw center <laughs> in there. So that's better. That's what we're looking for. You can see how it's nice and spongy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's cooked. All the way that's right. It's yeah. cooked all the way through. Okay. So I'm going to start off taking some of these out of the pot here. Just drain them. And then we're just going to put them on the tray to drain off the, the excess water. So if I let you carry on with that. Sure. Just to line those guys up. We'll just get this tomato sauce finished here. We're just going to give a good shot, probably about a quarter cup, a 
with that vodka, and that's really going to bring the flavor of the tomato. Tomato and vodka actually goes really well together. Right. Whenever you're cooking with alcohol, you want to burn the alcohol off. Okay. Alcohol tastes terrible. So you always want to make sure that whenever you're cooking with alcohol, you burn it off. So that's, that's evaporated already. It doesn't take okay, very long for that. Gonna, so just a couple of seconds, really. Just a couple of seconds. You know, <laughs> that you can do the dramatic flaming of it and whatnot. But <laughs> this works just as well. That, that evaporates quite well. Now what we need to do is put our basil into our tomato sauce. So I've turned the heat off Perfect. of the sauce. So we'll keep that greenery with the basil. Just stir the basil through. And then we'll just spoon that over our gnocchi. It's delicious. Mm, isn't that good? Yeah. A little heat from the jalapeno. Yeah. Gentle. That vodka is there. You can really. F I was going to say that I could smell it when you put the sauce on, but you, like, it just kind of complements the tomatoes really well. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for it's having been me. a pleasure. And um, I hope this is something you can incorporate and you can, you can let your nutritionist know that you've been. I might make it tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I can give you the recipe. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Ryan. And those are the flavors of Whistler. It's that time again. We're here with Rod Phillips of Liquor Plus. Rod, thank you very much. A little bit of an easy one, I think, for you today. We got some vodka sauce, some gnocchi, whole wheat gnocchi. I, you nice know, I'm one. a huge fan of gnocchi. It's one of my favorite styles of pasta. Yeah. And I've, so this is great. The three wines I've selected here, I'm gonna start with uh, one of my favorite Pinot Noirs uh, on, the, on the planet right now, and that is the Cassini Pinot Noir. It's made right here in BC. It's under $20, and it is, you know, go out and buy a case. This is absolutely a don't walk to the store, run to the store kind of wine. Uh, the flavors in here are black cherry and ripe, uh, ripe plums, and boy, oh, I could just—it's pretty bold for a Pinot. It is, and look at the, just look at the color. You yeah. get a really rich, really rich color. And isn't that just like silk? I gotta agree with you. Oh, That's one of the man. best Pinots I've tasted in a very, very long time. Yeah, big, nice, rich. And you say this is flavor. under twenty bucks. Under twenty bucks. That's awesome. Under twenty bucks. Yeah. Now the second one is just a really nice one to say to begin with. Raccolto. Raccolto. Nero davola sira. I'll stick with the raccolto. Okay. <laughs> now, this comes out of Sicily, and Nero davola to me will be well. It could be one of those competitors for Malbec and Australian Shiraz because it is really rich and dense, lots of fruit, and again the texture will go with this dish so beautifully. So you get some bright acidity, which is coming from the Syrah. You get yeah. that nice bright acidity, which again will work so well with the tomatoes. And this is just one of my favorite wines, period. This is the Cesare Marra Valparcello Reposso. I'm, I'm going to leave that one entirely <laughs> up to you. Well, so this was your favorite Pinot. This is the favorite ever? This is one of my favorite ever. This is my top five. This is quite now, a stable you brought today. It is. It is. Uh, so this is a good one. This is a good one to, to do. Uh, uh, Valparcello Reposso is a blend of three grapes that comes from the Veneto region. And they generally like to reduce the grapes by letting it uh, dry on dry mats. And you just get this really rich, big richness. And again, the texture is so silky and velvety. You know what? I am really coming around to Italian wines. Mm. That I, is fabulous. This is not Metanaki that it hasn't liked. I can believe it. Yeah, I so can absolutely you, believe you it. You can just picture yourself sitting in his lovely vineyard enjoying that gnocchi with this wine. With the, the vines over top of the patio Absolutely. and the rolling hills off in the distance. A little mandolin in the background. Rod, thank you very much for bringing out your two of your top favorite wines. Once Cheers. again, job well done. Happy to do it. Thanks again. Thanks.